one. And uh, I hope the coffee was good. Is it good? Was it good? Quality for product is important, right? So, Simone Portamussin. Uh, that's me, a little bit younger, uh, of course, and with a, without a moustache. What I wanted to bring you is a little bit of my journey, the insights and the learnings from um, a software as a service payment provider as part of a bigger corporate, like all the challenges that you could face, especially also if you're working for a startup or a fintech, what happens when you start to, you know, you're in consolidation, you, be, you, become, you get acquired, what are the challenges that you face there? So, but a little bit of who am I? Now, Simone Paul, a lot of people ask me, why Simone Paul uh, as a first name? I, I usually, the best explanation is for me, I was born in England, so I have a Paul in my name. My parents were Italian and they decided to have Simone, and it's just a mess. But anyway, I, I've lived with it. I lived also 60% of my 45 years in Italy. This means that for me, pineapple on a pizza is blasphemy. Don't try to do it with me, please. Thank you. I have also another joke, like uh, in a workshop, someone in Massacre, everyone knows about this. Of course, someone said, like, let's use pineapple as a safe word. So if we start to fight and we can, let's use pineapple and we stop everything. It's like, oh, 50 shades of grades, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm also, so I've also lived 40% of my life in England, especially in the last years. And this means, of course, I fancy my tea and I like my ale in the afternoon. So that's me. Uh, a little bit of background. When I studied uh, in um, business economics, I was studying marketing product. I love product. I wanted to work for Nestlé, Procter & Gamble, cool consumer products. I'll never work for a bank. Boring. First job, issuing in a bank, of course. Uh, but it was the right time because 2002, uh, things were changed. Like for decades, nothing happened. And you had cards, Max Stripe, and that's it. Then you started to see like a chip, a chip on a card. And I was like a young person going there in the bank, marketing team. Usually you had like really people looking for retirement. And I was the guy like starting to look, what could you add on a, on a, on a chip? Like starting to think about loyalty, how to follow the life of uh, someone, uh, change things, you go in an ATM. And they said like, yeah, a little bit too much, but we like you, come and join us. Okay, fine. And I never get out of the payments industry. Now, consumers, I said, like consumer products, like the merchant side is boring. I'll never get there. Yeah. Uh, started then to move into PayPal. Now, maybe I was a little bit wrong. I like also the merchant side. Things are changing also in that, uh, um, from that side of the business. 2011, I joined Post Italiane. And from there, I never got out of the merchant side of the business. Now, interesting thing also in MasterCard, I joined MasterCard as part of a startup initiative. So it was. Uh, coming out from labs, incubation, uh, 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 you have all the benefits of a startup. You know, you can test, do whatever you wanted, no processes. But then you can leverage the, the power of MasterCard going in the regions, trying to get all the connections and trying to expand your, your products and services. But then at some point you get acquired internally in MasterCard. No one becomes a millionaire. Uh, you just get a couple of promotions, but then you start to face all the difficulties and the challenges of being part of a corporate. So what? I'm crap at predicting my future. Never say never. I won't say it anymore. I just said it. And uh, I love product management and I love payments. Definitely. Uh, it's exciting. And it's exciting because you can change things for people. You can change things for different cultures and uh, nations, like bring a new digital agenda. That's really important. And that's why I like product, to be honest. What's a payment gateway? How many of you feel confident that they could say, what's a payment gateway? Yeah, I can imagine. So let's say you need to go on blah, blah, car and make that payment. I would say a good payment gateway is like if I'm invisible, everything is smooth. You don't know I'm even there. Fine. Blah, blah, car is happy. He's a merchant. The consumer is happy. I did my job. When I do some trainings for engineers joining my team, I use this to prank them and say, like, this is how we work. We are there. We tried, you know, merchants. They have, and, and the things are becoming more and more complex. You, at some point you start, but then in a country, but then you need to expand. And then if you are in some verticals, you need to, I don't know, in the gambling industry, you need to issue refunds. You need to have multi-currency pricing, tokenization, fraud solutions. The gateway is kind of there trying to make things easier for the merchants and try to, yeah, stay calm. I'll take care of it. I'll help you there. Not always like that, but let's see. Engineers, again, at the end, if you feel like this, it's fine. It's, it always happens to me every day. Don't worry. Uh, where do I work? So I'm part, I'm in a business unit that is part of MasterCard, the gateway services. We're kind of different from the rest of MasterCard, and we will see why. Uh, more than 20 years, 
pioneers in the white label industry, and this also brings a big challenge from our perspective, especially when you go in a lot of regions in regulated industries. Another thing, consolidation. Consolidation is a big thing. It means that at some point you can find yourself with six, seven development hubs across the world. Each one of them has a different platforms. Each one of them has different type of culture. How do you manage that? And then the growth of the industry. Like uh, for, for, since I've joined, like three times the growth of the development teams, three times the growth of our product team. Right now I have a product team of 40 individuals spread across those hubs. Not easy on a work-life balance, but yeah. We manage it. The challenges that I believe we can share, and if you want, of course, feel free to reach me for any kind of a coffee, a, a pint of beer, no pizza with a pineapple, but we can talk about it. Geographical dis distribution, how do we manage these different platforms, di different processes, a bucket of prioritization things, like how do we prioritize across all the different verticals of different products? How do you prioritize between global roadmap and bespoke solutions, especially if you're a white label provider? Build versus partner. At what point do you continue to build inside or do you start to look at partnerships? There's a brilliant payment gateway solution provider, checkout.com, that says they prefer to do everything inside. They're brilliant. Some others like us that need to do some other kind of decisions. And then corporate processes, as you, the moment you become part of a, a different type of corporate and you're trying to influence the way you work and global resource regional. So let's start with the geographical distribution. Mastica decided to implement safe, scaled agile framework. And then we decided also to change a little bit of the processes and it was a kind of a journey for us. Now, so how many of you are familiar with scaled agile framework? More than the gateway, fantastic. Now, at the moment, I was coming out from that lab's initiative. So coming from an agile, we will deploy in every day, we're trying to test things. And then they said, like, OK, we're implementing this. We're going to apply agile to our world and make things much better. And this was it. It's like, wow. OK, what does it mean? It means that you have to do this PI planning, so increment, decide everything every quarter. They are the portfolio limits. It's like, oh, that's interesting. This is. I'm not really convinced. I think it's more like a waterfall with an agile stuff, but <laughs> let's try to make it work. <laughs> let's go back to the journey. So as a, every story, once upon a time, we are told six apps, all those development teams, what did you do? Brilliant way to start, lots of, lot of lessons learned. We started with one, one, one agile team, all the countries, all the locations at the same time working all together. We had our first PI planning session across six days. Basically, never stop. You could have people at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. working across the world. It was just not sustainable. So we regrouped and said, OK, done, dust it. We tested it. Next phase, what should we do? Brilliant idea. And that's worked much better. Split the trains into two. So we have one that is called Super Bullet, super fast, UK, India. And then another one more relaxed, Pacific Glider, Australia, Bondi Beach. Yeah. I'm based in UK, I've become a, a product owner. You'll become a product owner of one of the, of the two trains. Which one? This one. Uh, not great for the work-life balance, but amazing opportunity to see a lot of people, and especially when you fly over there for PI planning in, uh, in our winter. That's amazing, I would say. Some burnt, of course. Um, so you start an experience. It's a different app. I was coming again from labs. I'll, I'll stop saying that. Uh, you find a different culture, different platform, different ways of working. So the first problem I've seen, it was like there was no alignment between what the regions, the customers were asking and what the global product wanted to do. So the product managers working on a team were like, what should we do? What are our priorities? At some point, they would just start to write down as many features as they could, just getting ready for the next PI planning sessions. I found like a, a structure where there was just two engineers, two architects that were basically wanted to review each single feature of the entire train and do the solution in advance of everything. Like, yeah, not really agile, weeks and weeks. And then the moment they defined the solution, then it would give it to the product owners and the product managers to break it down in further features in the stories. You lose weeks. In the meantime, you're still working on the previous PI. What happens? that once you go to the PI planning, you're not really ready for it. You go into it, the development teams is the first time they're looking at the features, they just rush to the wall to grab the feature, the post-it of the feature that they like the most, they feel more confident. 
still the architects trying to, those two architects trying to jump there and make some issues, product owners that were like trying, okay, I'll work with this team, I'll work with the other one. In terms of leadership, we were like micromanaging. I still remember like one PI, I was in the, in the conservatory here in London, 4 a.m. writing up features, trying to solve like some, like some debates. So we were asking, where's our train heading to? Not really well. So we had two things to do. One was the process. I like to use processes to remove any kind of conflicts and funnels. And of course, like in the industry, there are a lot of models that we can just copy paste. And uh, we said like, let's try to implement the squad model. A lot of work on trying to convince uh, the other peers and the other stakeholders. So how did it change the model? So, I mean, for squads, tribes, uh, kind of nothing, nothing new product managers, product owners, development teams working, working on features that are linked to their capabilities, so defining remits, so that they could have like clear roadmaps that they could manage, they could work on an ongoing base, no more funnel, getting to the PI planning, getting ready. They started to share, create collaboration, they create a gang of squads that is basically a community of practice. I discovered it like after a few days and was like, yeah, like it, let's do it. And uh, what, what was happening is like in terms of better feature readiness, bottlenecks were removed, certainty to the development teams, engineers were happy, more engaged, they understood the products because they were working on the same products, of course, as the squad model work. It wasn't enough. We had to do also a lot in terms of culture. Um, and this is the where I try to use again safe. You're not a fan of safe, you understood that. Um, going back on the website, you can see from a cultural perspective, there are some things that you can use. And that's like, yeah, I like it. We are talking about going from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And uh, so I said, okay, we're doing this as a corporate, uh, the other corporate is telling us we need to go to safe. These are the new rules. So no more uh, behaviors that are, can't be accepted, like in terms of finger pointing. We are one team. Now, the best thing I've learned in all my life is like product and engineers need to be one team. You really need to work together, learn from mistakes and near misses. Another important thing, the near misses, they're not successes. You just need to learn from them because maybe the next time you will screw up entirely your, your product. Finger pointing every time someone came to us, like entire leadership, like someone finger pointing this went wrong because of product or engineering. Sorry, go back, work together and try to fix it. Diversity and equality, I think you've heard during the day a lot about diversity. This is super, super powerful. We incentivize a lot diversity and equality. Push and then don't hire people that just look like you, talk like you, maybe better than me, yeah? And uh, that think like you, because the more you, you, know, you use the diversity, the better you have that growth scenario. So what happened, in, uh, what happened? Did we live happily ever after? Yeah, I would say kind of yes. Feature readiness uh, went up from 50 to 80%. People finally collaborating. PI plannings, uh, risks that at the end of a PI planning, you need to roam in terms of accepting them or mitigating them or resolving them. They went down from a board of 60 risks that took us three hours to, to assess just less than 10 risks. And uh, we were also able, because it happened also during the COVID pandemic, to do these PI plannings online really smoothly. 300 people connected all together going up, resolving everything, three days, done it, dusted. And then we rolled it out to all the other de uh, remaining development teams. So this was one part of the journey, one part of the challenges. Then other challenges in terms of prioritization, everyone in product needs to prioritize, what do we do? And we have different layers because of course we also white label. So it means like this customer wants everything about this. Should I do too much of the most, my, my, top, my top customer? Or should I try to you know, push my global roadmap? And what's the trade-off? And also build versus partner. Now, we talked about squads. Of course, squads, they have their backlog. They can decide. But if you do too much, give too much autonomy, we've seen, you create almost a multiverse of gateways. And that's not really what you want. It's kind of madness, right? So where, where we want to do, I really like this chart, is like, I really want to define, like, I need to cross the river, go figure it out, but you need to cross the river, not build an hotel. So this is where I want to be. What we did is, like, of course, uh, again, nothing new. 
but in trying to implement it, it changes a lot. So starting from the leadership team and the community. So you create like a level where there's a corporate strategy and the impacts you want to drive at a corporate level. And then you discuss in terms of leadership of those two areas, what are the outcomes that you want to achieve to get to those impacts? Once these outcomes are defined, then the communities have kind of the ability to work by themselves, define what is important, discuss with the regions like, yeah, okay, I understand the need from customer A, B, and C, but we need to build it in a way that we can scale. If we go too much for just one customer, then it's a nightmare to manage all these well available solutions. I mean, you've seen we had 180 acquirers, thousands of merchants, it's impossible to manage. So I also like to say on the top level, we define who you want to be, the why, revenue opportunity, whatever is the impact, and where do we want to go. And then the communities work on what, how, and when, like how we drive it, what are the things that we need to do to stop doing, enhance and have that kind of ownership. Uh, another thing is like also build as a partner. I said it before, that's super important for us. Also try to define like a lot of frameworks so we can enable, unlock the ecosystem, work with other partners. We are MasterCard. So we need to not only look from our perspective of a, of a business as a gateway, but we need to look into an ecosystem that we need to enable and test and try on. So, um, So the last part of the challenge is working on the corporate and process. So you see, I usually say that the gateway inside the payments industry, I believe, is probably the most difficult, complex product area. I've worked in the issuing, I've worked in the acceptance, I've worked in a lot of areas, I've worked in PayPal. We are kind of several platforms, one platform if you're lucky, or if you're a startup or starting from scratch. But in that platform, you could have at some point like hundreds of products and services. The rest of MasterCard, most of the products are monoline, so you have a debit card, a prepaid card, a fraud solution. And the moment you have, as, as a corporate, you're trying to define standards and processes, please look at all the products lines and the business units, because if you try to implement something that works for a monoline, it probably will work for all the other ones. So that's the part of a, a challenge that we had. And then we try to find our way, flexibility, how to influence it, and make sure that we can survive there. The other part, global versus regional. So we have a global product, we own our product, we own our area. In the regions, like if you work in companies like this, then usually you have experts that are not really experts in your area, but they need to work with the customers and serve like, have a knowledge that is across several products, like as an example, all the massive range of products. Now, how to address them? Uh, I mean, product school will probably teach you that first thing as product managers, you, enter, you need to understand the customer needs. But hey, the regional teams are my customers, so what did we try to do? What do you need to try to do? The same thing you would do with your customers, talk to them, understand the pain and needs, create dedicated personas. At some point, I had like personas for each single regional representative with what were the needs, how can I help them to be successful with their other personas that are the final customers and create a value proposition for the regional teams. So as an example, I created, uh, when, I, when I was at the time of LAMPS, I created a lot of demo solutions for our account managers. I work on creating storytelling solutions that they could easily use. I would go in roadshows together with them, do the first uh, presentations in front of the customers, where you don't start, of course, from the product, you start from the pain point, the needs, you create a link, and then it's easy to sell the product. And then the product started to sell. So really look at, if you're in a situation and you end up in a situation like this one, feel that the sales team, the regional teams, the account managers are customers in the same way as your real customers. Okay, so this, and I've saved like, a lot of time. Uh, I think I was going to ask the three minutes that Ben spared, I would use them, no I don't. So I have a quick quiz. How many times did I use my photo in the, in the slide? Two times? Three times? I mean, I think that is just a silly question just to save some time and make you, you can remember me. <laughs> okay, grazie. Thank you very much. <laughs> Feel free to, to reach me LinkedIn. Twitter, not that much. Able for a coffee, as I said, any question. <laughs>